So last week we talked about um, the decline, our, our numbers declining, and uh, how do we respond to that. And I, I just want to make sure I reiterate again, okay, uh, I don't want it to become about numbers because it's not about numbers, all right? Uh, numbers are a measure, but we want to make sure that what our our thoughts, our prayer, our concern is, is that we are reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we're seeing their lives transformed. Sometimes it's because of our scars um, that, that will change that. Uh, we can't become complacent. We can't com become complaining. We want to compliment both ways that that's spelled, both meanings uh, as we consider uh, the work of God in our lives and in the work of our community, that we not only come alongside and, and aid and, uh, and do what God is calling us to do, but that we speak well of what God is doing. All right? Um, we continue on in the faith and, and continue to do what God is calling us to do. Part of that is our purpose, okay? And so I'm just going to ask you to read it with me and think through, how did you do this week? How did you do as part of the church accomplishing each of these, these parts of our purpose? All right, so let's read it together. We are a church where people believe in Jesus for salvation, fellowship in his family, learn from his word, grow as his disciples, serve in his church, and witness in his world for the glory of God. There's six things there that we say that we value, that the reason that we have a congregation, a, a called out assembly, an ecclesia, uh, is to accomplish this in this area that God has called us to. All right? Um, so, again, let's pray. Ask God to help us to do that, even as we look at Acts chapter 9. Father God, our desire is to please you. We realize that you have called us, that you have purposed us, and Lord, we pray that you would help us to accomplish that which you purpose. Lord, we know that you can and will accomplish your purpose, but Lord, we ask to be the tools that you would use and that we would be willing tools, uh, that we would respond correctly. So open the eyes of our heart, Lord, Help us to see what you're about and help us to respond as we should. We ask in Christ's name, amen. So we are in the book of Acts and we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 this morning. Um, Stephen, uh, one of the trustees <laughs> of the church, uh, is stoned for his witness, for his great defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His, Defense of Jesus Christ. And um, that catapulted the church out of Jerusalem. Uh, and, and they went everywhere and they, they shared the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, he was able to uh, preach. Uh, Philip was the number two trustee. He was able to preach in Samaria. All right, so the, the good news is spreading just as God had told uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Um, there, uh, we, we get to see uh, individuals come to know Christ as their Savior. All right? And then I came across this illustration, which I thought I should probably preface where we're at in Acts chapter 9. Um, there was, there was a, a kid who was born, and his last name was Odd, O-D-D. Okay? And you can imagine going up through school, he got picked on all the time. Uh, about his last name, Oddball, you're an oddity, and, uh, and things like that. So he determined that when he died, he did not want his name on his headstone. Okay, Instead, he decided that he would put on his headstone, here lies an honest lawyer. And so after he died and he was buried, people would walk through the cemetery, they would see the headstone, and they'd say, wow, that's odd. Yeah, okay, so my purpose in that is, I, what I'd really like you to do is, as we go through this next story, 
that I'm fairly sure you know that you would look at it again and say, wow, that's odd. I fear we get too used to the things we think we know. And I, I don't have any great, you know, hidden Greek meanings this morning that, that is going to like totally twist the story. That's not what I'm hoping that you come away from it. I, I hope that you come away from it yet again with the fact that this guy is an enemy to everything and becomes an evangelist of everything that Christ is doing. Let's look at the story of the conversion of Saul. The whole, we're going to look at the whole chapter. Then Saul, still breathing, okay? And the, the import of this is, is that this is, this is everything to him. I mean, he, he's just fuming, and it's his life and breath. He is breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, which was um, a large city, a, a, a part that had a lot of synagogues. There was a, a good traditional Jewish community there, and they were seeing the inroads of God scattering the disciples. And, and Saul has this burning desire to make sure that it does not impact Damascus like it's impacted Jerusalem. So that if he found any who were of the way, right, not called Christians yet, any of the way, any of the ones who are following Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, that they find any of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. If you remember, Saul has been causing havoc, right? 8.3 says he made havoc of the church, entering every house, right? He's continuing this. He's going to do it in uh, Damascus. Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. All right, so this particular testimony of Saul is going to be recorded three times in the book of Acts, all right? Three times. And uh, from one of the other passages, um, we, we, we know that it's noon, midday, right? Uh, when the sun's the, sh the brightest and shining, and this light overwhelms the light of day, right? You ever had a flashlight that you thought's really good? You take it out in the middle of the day, and you're thinking, nothing, right? This is the glory of God shining and it knocks him to his feet. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered the way you probably would answer. Who are you? Who are you, sir? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Okay, so that statement is going to be a real problem. Right? Because he's going from house to house, persecuting, jailing, even killing any who are of the way, any of the ones who say, Jesus rose from the dead. And Saul would say, liar! And then, the dead guy talks to him. Right? Do you understand why this knocked Saul huh, punch to the gut? Well, what do you mean you're alive? And if you're alive then you are the Christ, the Son of God, speaking to me from the heavens. When we stoned Stephen, and he looked up and said, 
I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. I just thought he was lying more. Here you are addressing me. I'm the right hand of the Father. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Who are you? If you're who you say you are, then what does that require of me? The Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. When his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He's blind. But they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. All right, so Saul is tremendously impacted. Right? He, he, he doesn't want to eat or drink. He, he's got three days that he's, he's contemplating what God has told him, what Christ has, has spoken to him. But... Before we go on with Saul, you realize he wasn't alone? Have you thought through that? That there's a crowd of people around him that they don't understand what's said and they don't repent? They're also supporters of Saul on his way to Damascus to get rid of the people of the way. There, they see the results of uh, an encounter with Christ and they're... As far as we know, unchanged. How close can you be to Christ and, and not change? Judas? How many weeks can you go to church and Sunday school and not be changed? I don't know. I've known people who've gone whole lifetimes faithfully. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, are you crazy? I'm at the top of his list. Excuse me, I've heard of this guy. Do you know what you're doing? I give Ananias all kinds of credit. All right? Because he probably was on the top of the list. He knew who Saul of Tarsus is. Word has come. Hey, Saul's gotten rid of, of Stephen. He's caused havoc in Jerusalem, and he's, he's coming. You, you guys need to be aware. Be ready. Here he comes. Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints. First time that the word saints is used. Those who are called set apart. All right? You are a saint. Well, not like the Catholics see saints. Right? But you have been called and set apart. Set apart to a different purpose. And, and Saul has come into town to, to take those saints and destroy them. Here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. <laughs> Do you understand? When Scripture says, Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. That it includes people who have you on the top of their hit list. Ananias evidently did. Ananias is transformed by the truth of God's word. 
to the point where he can love his enemy. The Lord said to him, go. The Lord said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. 2 Timothy 3 uh, reminds us, you've, Paul's writing to, to Timothy and says, you've carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Well, I find that to be a strange phrase. Because if I'm telling the Lord that he's delivering me, I ain't getting beat. Right? I mean, hey Lord, deliver me from this persecution. That means I get off scot-free. And that is not what Paul has in mind. That's not what God has in mind. I'll show him how much great of things he will suffer for my name's sake. And yet Paul, looking at it, says, and God delivered me through them all. So that whether it's divorce or addiction or Alzheimer's or cancer or hurricane or, or whatever, it's not that we got off scot-free. but that we can see. The Lord delivered me out of them all. And Paul finishes 2 Timothy 3 passage with, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. <laughs> I'm a child of God. Right? As we, as we repent of our sins, as we confess them to God, as we ask for forgiveness, as we, we trust in only the, the shed blood of Christ, as we trust only in his sacrifice for us, we are brought into the kingdom of God and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And Ananias recognizes this and he goes up to him, <laughs> the man for whom he should have been expecting to be killed or at least prisoned, brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Right? I mean, in the book of Acts, we see this immediate thing, that as God calls someone to themselves, to himself, as they repent and as they become believers, that they're act of obedience is to turn around and to publicly declare, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Right? Think about this. He's come into town to throw Christians into prison. Followers of the way. He is vehemently, violently opposed to Jesus Christ being Messiah. Christ confronts him. He accepts who Christ is. He follows. He says, what do I need to do to follow you? And he, he gets a little bit of training, reorientation, and immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Okay, so admittedly, okay, he has the background, right? <laughs> he has probably been debating and <coughs> challenging the thought of these Christians who've arisen, who said, well, Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Messiah. He fulfilled this prophecy and this prophecy and this prophecy. Look at the works and the miracles that he's done. 
Uh, he's healed the blind, ra raised the dead, made the way lame to walk. Um, he speaks the word of God. He, he's acknowledged by God. He's been risen from the dead. And obviously God's at power. And to all of that, Saul has been saying, no, can't be, uh-uh, he's not, who's mentioned in Isaiah, uh, no, no, no. And then he comes to Christ, and he realizes, yes, he is. Yes, he is. This is the Son of God. This, this does point to him. 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 And so immediately he gets up and he preaches, and he says, look, I was wrong. Here is where God in the Old Testament has completely laid out his, his plan of salvation, and, and this is the fulfillment. The Messiah is the fulfillment. Jesus of Nazareth is the fulfillment. All who heard were amazed and said, is, not, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and came here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength. Right? So he starts out weak, right? Because God does grow us. But amazingly enough, with the way that God's called him and with the gifts that God's given him, and he, he immediately starts to preach. He immediately starts to put into practice that which God has gifted him with. All right, and so it's possible in this verse, Luke's going to do what? The gospel writers have been doing, right? They compress time. There's a three-year period that either goes here in verse 22 or goes in uh, verse after verse 25, all right? Um, where in Galatians chapter 1, Paul, in explaining his testimony, he, is, he goes to the desert, and Christ meets with him and trains him and teaches him. Uh, he, he's gone for three years. So it could be that this is what he's talking about as he says, Saul increased all the more in strength, right? <laughs> If you're with the Lord, hopefully, as a believer, you're getting uh, strengthened. All right, and then it says in Galatians one, after that time, he comes back to, Dam to Damascus. Okay, and so that would fit, and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Right, one violently opposed becomes absolutely convinced. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. <laughs> so we've got to get rid of this guy. He, he was our, our chief instigator, prosecutor. And now all of a sudden, here he is. He, he's, he's flipped. Literally. From one side to the other. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. All right, so, I mean, really? I mean, couldn't you, like, you know, use martial arts to escape? And, you know, it could have been something a little catchier, a little bit more dramatic, not nearly as humble as having to go down over the wall in a basket. I think that was the point. Very humbling. Very humbling. Because... Here he was, the big cheese. And now he's just being led over the wall in a basket. And again, it's possible that this is where he escapes. He's gone for three years and, and then. So it, it occurred to me, trying to think through what this is like. For my generation, Imagine if Saddam Hussein had come to know Christ and decided to become a missionary to Iran, Iraq. <laughs> Can you imagine that? This, this guy is uh, Abu Abrahim al-Hishmi al-Qureshi, okay, who just got to take over because we just killed the leader of ISIS. He's only been the leader since October. But imagine leader of ISIS, confronted by Jesus Christ and becomes a believer. And his response is to turn around and become a missionary. All right? 
So as I'm looking through this and thinking through this, I came across this guy who is, <laughs> well, sort of. Um, he's the African Regional Director for Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, Jasek went to Sudan to document the persecution of Christians, which was happening in the Nuba Mountains and clashes between the government and rebels, and was detained by the Sudanese police at Khartoum Airport in December 2015. Seems immigration staff found a duplicate passport that Jasek carried for security purposes, because if they steal your passport, you still want a passport to be able to get out of the country. Um, but that's, they determined that was illegal. They immediately arrested him and imprisoned him and threw him in a cell where all six of his cellmates were ISIS fighters. Two days later, they started to openly torture me and beat me. I was hit. And he's in prison. They're in prison, and they're torturing him because he's a believer, and they're ISIS. Jasek was hit on the head, shoulders, fingers. They would kick him in the stomach, back with their boots. At that time, I was really thinking about the Lord Jesus and what he had to go through when he was arrested. And they also were beating him with a wooden stick and were ridiculing him, slapping him. I became like their slave. I was made to wash the clothes, wash the dishes, clean the toilet with my bare hands. They were making fun of me. I did not resist. I could clearly see the Lord Jesus and how he suffered for us. And Jesus imparted something to him that was amazing and unexpected considering the circumstances. I received a wonderful peace at that time. I can't imagine that. Surprisingly, when I was physically attacked, I was experiencing the greatest peace in prison time ever. All those 15 months, I could pray during these beatings for my family members. I could pray for other fellow prisoners. I was m not moved to the point um, when I used to be before because I had this peace from the Lord at this time of the physical attacks on my body. When Jasek began to exalt and glorify the Lord's name during his beatings, this made them even more furious. They decided to torture me even more in much worse ways. They decided to do waterboarding in the prison on another prisoner. Right? I mean, this, is, this doesn't even make sense. So finally he gets moved to a, a different prison. Um, been in solitary confinement. Uh, they move him to a prison where it can hold 10,000 people and he goes from, a solid, from solitary to a cell where there are 100 people in one cell. Uh, amazingly, guards at the new prison allowed him and two incarcerated Sudanese pastors to hold worship services. The first day I came to the chapel to spend time in Scripture with the Lord, they asked me to preach. Of course, they were monitoring us and they were reporting what we were teaching about. There were two other pastors from Sudan. We knew what, that nothing worse could happen to us. So we preached. Preaching in prison allowed Jessic and the other pastors wit to witness to people that were hopeless. Real criminals, murderers, rapists, thieves, drug dealers. It was such a wonderful time. How could you say that? They responded to our teaching. We were just teaching the gospel. It was so wonderful to see the changed life of those who dedicated their lives to Christ. He went for a four-day trip. It turned into 16 months. Um, for me, <laughs> all right, um, I like to watch Penn and Teller. Penn and Teller are both atheists, and Penn is a very articulate, outspoken uh, atheist. Um, that was the cleanest quote I could come up with, um, and I had to crop part of the picture. Um, because he, he just makes no bones about it. He just does not think that faith, Bible, Scripture, that any of it's real. He thinks it's a hoax. And, and yet, you see what he says about atheists. He thinks that they have true and real morality. Right? And, and so, for me, I, I've been challenged yet again this week. Do I think that it would be impossible for Pendulette to come to know Christ? No. God says, I am the Lord. The God of all mankind is anything too hard for me. 
Now before you just go with the quick, Amen! So, who of your family have you just kind of given up on? God could never save them. Who of your friends have you looked at and thought, well, it, they're going to hell. But I surely can't stop them. God can't stop them. Right? You, you never, you don't think you'd hear yourself say that out loud. But ha, have you, have you gotten your your coworkers, your your neighbors? I mean, seriously, who can you put on the same level as Paul, Saul, in your life? He is not seeking after God. Right? He's on the road to Damascus to kill and imprison Christians. And God, boom! Says, hey, you will recognize me for who I am. Please don't miss that while God can do exactly what He did with Saul to everyone, that He often, majority of the time, chooses not to. Right? He works through people. Why didn't He just lay out the whole thing for, for Saul on the road to Damascus? No, He has him go into town, and then He takes Ananias to come to him and to minister to him and to, to disciple him. And after three years, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him because they'd all seen the movies where people act like one thing and turn and become traitors, right? Because, I mean, honestly, wouldn't that be what's going through your mind? I, you know, I, again... Kanye West, I have no idea. I really don't. Time will tell. But I do know that there are believers who are working and discipling with him and trying to make sure that, that what he's, he's doing is right, true, right? Does that mean he'll never, uh, never blow it? <laughs> well, if you've never blown it, <laughs> then you feel free to think that he should never blow it. But I happen to know that I've blown it several hundred times and that he probably will because that's what... Babies do. They make messes. Right? And, and they blow it. And thankfully, we have a forgiving God who restores and, 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 and pulls us back in. So Saul comes to Jerusalem, and the disciples there are not all that eager. They're all afraid, did not believe that he was a disciple, but Barnabas, but Barnabas. Okay, so Barnabas isn't, an apostle, he's not a, dis a disciple, he, he's not even a trustee. <laughs> um, right? Well, we owe Barnabas a great debt. Between Saul and John Mark, he's responsible for encouraging and discipling those who would write one third of our New Testament. That's Barnabas. Right? And here his role is. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him, how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Saul is taken in on the word of Barnabas. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Okay? And here, to me, is the amazing thing. Okay? We're going to really rush through the rest, last part of this. Um, so they find God takes Saul out of the equation. He evidently was the chief instigator for the problems that were going on. And he trains him and takes him out for three years and he brings him into Jerusalem and, and 
Things are still upset in Jerusalem. But what we read next, the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. Okay, so again, Luke has jumped, all right? The gospel will go out to Jerusalem, Judea, and, all, and Samaria, and all ends of the earth. We heard about Jerusalem. We've heard about Samaria. We didn't really hear a whole lot about Judea, but this verse reminds us that, hey, it had happened, right? That the gospel had, and, then, and there were churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And so God brings a period of peace so that everybody can kick back and go to the Bahamas. Evidently not. God brings a period of peace so that they can all walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and they can multiply. Right? And God has given us peace for the, the, for the most part and for a great extent here in America. And are we accomplishing His purpose? I don't know. Other nations are sending missionaries here because we don't seem to be reaching Americans for Christ. The last part of the chapter seems like it just takes a right turn. But I'm going to submit to you that it doesn't. It switches people. We're back to Peter. But every believer in Christ should be a follower of Christ. Right? And so we read here two miracles that take place. Acts chapter 9, now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints, again, the word, second use of the word saints in the book of Acts, who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. And he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon, that's the plain of Sharon, saw him and turned to the Lord. Say, uh, so? Well, don't you kind of find it funny that this is like a repeat? Let me read John 5, 7. The sick man answered Jesus, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. <laughs> and so Peter says, I've seen this done before. And I feel the Spirit of God is telling me, Aeneas, <laughs> we're going to do this just like Jesus did. Not because I've got this magic formula and that if I say these words that Jesus said, no, because the Spirit of God is moving and because the Spirit of God wants you to rise up and walk and, hey, but you know what? I'm going to do it just like Jesus did. What would Jesus do? <laughs> He'd tell you, be healed, rise, walk. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named, that, named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did, but it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room, and since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Peter arose and went with them. When he'd come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. She's got a great gift, and using it to minister to the body of Christ, right? And they're missing her. But Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he called the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon and Tanner. All right, so again, let me submit to you Mark chapter 5. Then Jesus came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. They ridiculed him, but when he had put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child, those who were with him, entered where the child was laying, and he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kume. And Peter changes one letter. Talitha kume. Little girl arise, 
Jesus says. Peter says, Tabitha, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. <laughs> and Peter says, hey, I'm just going to do what Jesus would do. <laughs> and so you're wondering about that very last sentence. It was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Now Peter's a good Jewish boy. Right? And Jewish boys, good Jewish boys, care about who they stay with. And no good Jewish boy would stay with a tanner. Because tanners constantly dealt with dead animals. They were constantly defiled. The, the Jewish leadership had made it that they couldn't, they had to live at least 75 feet outside of town. Do you see that God is transforming Peter. And next chapter, it gets worse or better, depending on whether or not you like pork. All right? See, if we continue in God's Word, all right? Are you reading God's Word? Are you allowing it to transform you? You're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. You'll be able to follow after Christ as you should. <laughs> reading this chapter, again, I am confronted with the fact, will I, will I trust that God is God of all power? That He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think? That Truthfully, if I'm going to pray and intercede for my family, my friends, my co-workers, my neighbors, that indeed God is powerful enough to bring them to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Because He did it for me. And do I understand <laughs> that if that is true in my life and if it will be true in their life, that they will change? That if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. What are you hanging on to? He didn't save you to give you your old life. He saved you to transform you, to give you a new life. All things have become new. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is your life any different than it was a year ago? Has God worked in a significant way in your life that you can look back one year ago and say, wow, that's odd. Just a Repeat that. Can you look back to last week? Can you say, wow, God's worked in my life since last Sunday? Let's pray. Father God, I, I pray for us. We need to remember how powerful you are we need to remember how powerful the gospel is, that it's life-changing. Father, we pray that if we're resisting you, if we're holding back from you, that, Lord God, we would, we would give in. You will win. Lord, May your word minister to us. May the truth of your word grip us. May we, may we be changed. May the world see it. May they be drawn to you. May they understand the miracle of this new life. And may it amaze those in the surrounding area. We ask you in Christ's name. Don't forget to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. 
Tonight we have the opportunity to um, to pack shoe boxes that get to carry the good news of Jesus Christ to a world. I I hope that you'll come. It, it is fun. I, I I will admit it is fun. It it, it it's enjoyable. Um, bring if you haven't brought your stuff, it needs to be here this morning. If you can get it here this morning by four o'clock, I guess at the very latest. If you can help and help at four o'clock, uh, get things organized, that would be great. Um, there's there's much to do. All right, um, read through your bulletin. There's events that are ahead uh, for us. Um, let me just draw your attention to. Uh, um, <laughs> Everything Christmas has started. It started snowing, and so now we're in Christmas. Okay, I'm sorry for those who are purists who are waiting for after Thanksgiving. I wish I could wait that long as well. But um, let me just remind you again, um, Christmas is an opportunity for us uh, to impact our community, impact our neighbors, and, and, and I hope that you take individually time to do it. As a church, one of the things that, that we desire to do is to present uh, the truth of the birth of Christ, factual, and the reason for it. Uh, we do that partly through uh, Christmas in the Park. Um, we need people to participate in that. We need... Um, uh, you don't have to preach like Paul or Saul, um, but we, we need people who are willing, who have had God change their lives, who can walk with people through... Uh, and and just be available to say, hey, yeah, you know, this is true in my life. <laughs> you know, I came to know the Christ child, right? If God puts that on your heart, get involved. Let's pray. Oh no, we did pray. Let's sing. <laughs> we prayed once. Let's sing. <laughs>